Welcome to the fourth in our series of Institute Encounters for the 2014-2015 academic year. In this interview, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Suni Oyang. Uh, Dr. Oyang is uh, an independent scholar whose work covers many, many fields, a genuine polymath. Uh, she has done work in physics, in the philosophy of science, in the relationship of quantum theory to mind, the uh, future of, of engineering, uh, and most lately, and of course of interest, greatest interest to us here today, uh, is the work that she has done in comparative civilization history. Um, she is the author of The Eagle and the Dragon, which is a comparative study of ancient Rome and ancient China, particularly uh, the formation of the Chinese Empire uh, and the Han Dynasty in China, which was the first long enduring uh, dynasty ruled by uh, a centralized regime and an emperor. Um, and what she does in the novel uh, is to elucidate very, very clearly and interestingly uh, the differences and the similarities between the two empires, uh, how they each characteristically face their challenges, um, and how they laid the basis, respectively, uh, for the modern West and the modern East. It's, it's our notion here at the Institute for the, West, for the Study of Western Civilization that you can't understand any civilization, including Western civilization, without understanding it in world context, without understanding it in relationship to other civilizations. So we could not have, I think, a more appropriate uh, guest and learned guest uh, than, uh, than Dr. Ao Yang. So welcome. And uh, let me just begin by um, asking you, uh, what was it that, that made you, after doing uh, such different types of work in the past, what made you want to write a book about the West, about the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire? Well, <clears throat> I've been working in the history and philosophy of science for a long time, but that view is still quite concentrated, quite narrow. Uh, about 10 years ago, my father passed away, and he always thought that, you know, well, I'm a Chinese, and I sent the children to America, to the West, to study, and after a while they stayed in, in the West for so long, as they have forgotten about their origin and tradition, so country. When my father pa passed away, that made me think about my future, and I feel, well, maybe it's time for me to go back to my own root, to my own tradition. So at the time I start, started studying Chinese, Chinese history and philosophy. But then for me, well, I have to, I am tired and try to do something to concentrate my effort. But I know that if I do something all the way back to Chinese, it's a big gap. So, but I'm now in America, I'm very, well, I'm more familiar with the Western civilization. So for, for a step back, I try to do some comparative study. And at the time, well, I'd be always interested in the ancient uh, Greeks and Romans. I was reading, and at the time also, there are um, uh, September 11 and the invasion, of, and there was talk about American Empire or something. I remember this was um, January 1st, New Year's Day, I was reading uh, some Greek stuff, and the idea suddenly came to me, oh, how about Roman? Roman and, and the Chinese Empire. Okay, that's the idea. I've got that idea. And then I, once I got the idea, that's easy. I got the idea before me. I just study on, on this, just all the research is concentrated on it. From then on, then it's comfortable. Well, few, few people, even professional historians uh, who say knew the history of ancient Rome very well, mm. would have had the boldness to embark on a comparative study, and, and, and you doing it without being a historian by profession uh, is, is really quite, quite remarkable and, and shows the kind of courage that, that, that we like here in the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, looking at really big questions, um, 
stretching one's compass and learning new things. I, I, I really think it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you've done. Uh, did you have any presuppositions about what you would find when you started this? Um, did you, uh, at the end of, of the research, did you have a very different view in any ways of either Rome or China than what you had at the beginning? Oh, sure, a lot. At the beginning, um, my idea of the Roman is glorious. It's okay. My standard when I started is mostly high school, high school level. I didn't have a well. I have a one year in uh, history in UCLA. I passed that, that by examination very quickly. So I didn't have uh, any college really level of, of um, knowledge. So my uh, from high school history, I know that okay. Rome was glorious. Uh, China, especially the Qing Dynasty, was terrible, most tyrannical, so mm -hmm. and so forth. So when I started studying it, that might completely changed. Uh, Rome was the cruelty. Well, that was okay because the gladiator and that sort mm -hmm. of right. But the Chinese part, the Qing Dynasty, when I started studying it, I looked into the original literature. Um, okay, that's one thing about my background. I was trained as a, a physicist, okay, the scientific backgrounds uh, is very important because they teach me to look at the facts, don't believe in what mm -hmm. they said or authority says. So I just go back to the original literature and try to look at it. And I always jump up and find well, what are the original literature or the evidence to say that they have done all sorts of terrible things. Well, they did those terrible things, but at the time it was totally terrible. I mean, yes. there's a savage mm -hmm. age. Everyone does, did that. So they were not particularly bad as in comparison to what came before or after. Mm -hmm. But in the story, in the traditional Chinese story, it was a, it's a singularity of evil in between a good sages uh, period and the uh, sagacious period later on. The confusion took over. Now, that's, that's very interesting because, you know, in the West, we tend to uh, not deify, but, it, but, but certainly think that there's something heroic and um, uh, e extraordinarily uh, admirable, uh, exemplary uh, about great men and the things they do, even when the things they do um, are bloody. And so, you know, the memory, for example, of, of Julius Caesar, um, kind of mixed story nonetheless, but you know, he's always been seen as, as one of the very great men uh, of the age and, and later emperors in, in, in medieval and modern times actually took his name uh, as their title. Uh, you know, Augustus, who founded the Roman Empire, we, we think of him as this extraordinary statesman. Um, Alexander the Great, you know, who conquered a vast stretch of terror, conquered the Persian Empire, essentially. Uh, we, you know, look at him as this sort of glorious, youthful, almost godlike hero. Um, it's, it's interesting that in Chinese historical tradition, the man who conquered the entire Chinese world in a short period of time, um, was his title, was his given name Cheng? Cheng? Yes, sure, right, thing, yeah. right. Uh, the, the king of, of the uh, Qing, of the, of the Qin mm -hmm. uh, kingdom. Um, conquered it, created a single empire, did pretty much what Augustus did, maybe even did a, lo a lot more than Augustus did. Uh, created what then endured as China right down to the present day. Uh, and yet his historical memory was as a villain, uh, kind of an unmixed, dark picture uh, of a bloodthirsty tyrant, whereas that's not the way in which the West has looked at Julius Caesar or Augustus or Alexander the Great, even when they recognize that they did have their cruelties. And how did that happen? A man who should have been the first emperor, he should have been thought of as this glorious figure, uh, nonetheless in, in the received wisdom of, of, of Chinese people, has always been remembered uh, as a villain. How did that come to be? Well, first of all, his Qing dynasty. Qing is actually the name of China derived from Qing. Uh, the, just even before uh, Qing unified China, Qing was set in the western part of China. So all the uh, communication with the west passed through Qing land. So Qing was there for five centuries. So therefore, China derived from Qing. The, the name Chinese 
the name China is not used in a China problem. <laughs> okay, Qin unified China, but the Qin dynasty collapsed in 15 years. So the loser is, is always the villain. Mm -hmm. Okay, history is written by his successor, which was, well, the rebels, number one. Number two, Qin antagonized the ruling elite, the people who wrote the history, especially the Confucians. At the time, there was a big power struggle between uh, the aristocracies, which was the original ruling elite, and the foreigners of the Confucians. And also, they were the monarchists for centralized power. They were, uh, they were the legalists who designed the structure, the political organization, bureaucratic structure. So there were power struggle between the two groups. So in the Qing dynasty, when the Qing uh, unified China, they decided which way to go. So the first emperor, the Qing Shi Huang, the, he decided to go the legalist way of centralized government. So what he did, he said, well, abolish the, the total, uh, total abolish the, the um, uh, feudal, feudal aristocracy. No, that of course the power struggle goes on, went on. So about ten years after the initial decision, the opposition just came on um, rising. So what they decided is there were uh, uh, advocates of reviving the feudal aristocracy and so on. So that is the point. Where, that was the point when he said, that, "Well, they burn books and suppress them." So he burned the books. The, most of the book he burned was the history of the original six states. They want to erase mm -hmm. memory. The Romans were very good at that. Erase memory. Second, they burned the what became the Confucian classics. Though those classics were even essentially the literature of the feudal aristocrats. Okay, you want to revive the aristocracy? No way. Burn everything. So that was the major crime, his major crime. Later on, of course, when the Qing dynasty collapsed, when the Confucian became the elite again, who they want to vilify? This guy. So he became the um, big villain for suppression and so on and so forth. But his suppression was mostly the biggest crime was the burn, burn, burn the books. Um, even today, for, for some, there was just a... Um, Nova program coming up on the uh, the mm -hmm. Terracotta Army. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah, it was said that okay, he was the big uh, tyrant, the biggest tyrant, and he uh, went on a frenzy of burning books. But actually, he didn't. It was ten years after unification, as a reaction to the promotion of a reinstated aristocracy, and he burned books. And he burned. He didn't burn them all. He saved copies in the library for for the official. Um, the scholars to use. But that has become the major crime, it just blow up. And later on, when the Confucians took over, when they write history, when the Rohit is just, just put on all what, whatever they thought is bad, they put on the Qing and say, well, see, because he did this, 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 and therefore Qing fell. Therefore, they said to the Emperor, you should not do this. Mm -hmm. So all of the, most of the, the crimes that he did was actually fabricated in, and, and imputed it to him. So, and, and, and credit for unifying China sort of was submerged. Yes, yeah, submerged. They don't, uh -huh. don't really mm -hmm. kind of celebrate yeah. that particularly. Um, so a lot of what you've done and, and the, the argument that you make with respect to China has to do with the importance of Confucian ideology uh, and um, Blackening his name, I guess, is, is, is one part of the story. But the rest of the story then is, is how they proceeded actually to take the forms of government uh, that he had created um, and utilize them, but utilize them uh, with a new kind of twist, utilize them in a Confucian spirit and create a kind of new type of, of aristocracy. And you, and you think that uh, that uh, has effects right down to the present day and has, has been, in some respects at least, harmful to China. Could you tell us a little more about that? Oh yes, uh, see in China, the, the legalists and the Confucians, they represent, there are two kinds of uh, uh, philosophy to government. If they can cooperate well, that's very good for China. But the legalists introduce the idea, the, what Westerners call political ideas, as a kind of rule from a uh, rule restraint uh, operation of the empire, uh, of uh, state, 
regulations and so forth and so forth. While the Confucians were, okay, that if you talk about in ethical terms, the legalists were consequentialists. They, mm -hmm. talk, they, uh, they thought about, if I have a policy, I thought about the consequence, the consequence of good or bad, and decide uh, how good is the policy. The Confucians were actually virtuous, virtue theists. Okay, when I decide on policy, it's, it's my, my intention. I'm virtuous, I'm righteous, therefore my policy must be good. Uh, whatever the consequence, you don't talk about the consequence, those are... So if these two branches of thinking can really co cooperate and merge, that'd be very good for China. Mm -hmm. But because of the um, power struggle at the beginning, and when the Confucians took over, they just completely demonized the, the legalist. The, the structure, the government structure remained. So they didn't have an aristocracy in the old right, sense. Right, also, yeah. Then yeah. they had a bureaucracy, mm -hmm. which is legalist. Right, mm -hmm. legalist. There's a bu bureaucracy, but then the the officers, the few, few have a uh, few the bureaucracy, the bureaucrats had aristocratic ideals. So they were talking about, they instead um, they're talking about um, personal connections, family values, and so on, and suffused the government in operation. So in that way, they sort of, uh, the rule structured part has been very, very submerged. Not only submerged, become demonized. When you talk about law, that at once talk about punishment. Actually, in the later, in the after the Han Dynasty, the Han uh, inherit all the chain offices and uh, the name of the offices. After the Han Dynasty, what uh, we now call the Justice Department, they become the Department of Punishment. Mm -hmm. So the idea of law, the clarity, the publicity and the equality of laws completely erased. Raw law became punishment, department of punishment. It's, it's, it's the last resort for the people who are really not virtuous. <laughs> not virtuous, right, them. exactly. But you hope that you don't have to get there. You hope that virtue by itself will see you through. Yes, that's in, true. In, right. Including the, the people at the top. Mm -hmm. So there was never a sense of a need for a constitution or a need to restrain authority mm -hmm. uh, in, in China. Uh, it, it all comes down to the, uh, the character of the people who are running the state. That's what you're supposed to concentrate on. Right, right. It's not even a need. Even the idea itself mm -hmm. has been demonized. Uh, well, if you want to meet a rule to the government, that means uh, coercive. Um, the, uh, a rule for the ruling elite? No, 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 no. The elite has to be good at the beginning. So, and this would be true in China today, the way that they, the way that they would look at the goals of good government would be in terms of a virtuous elite rather than in terms of a structure of law. I, th I think so. <laughs> and you don't think, and, and, and how does that work out in terms of the need of a modern country? Well, I think uh, they need to have the rule of law, the idea of the law rehabilitated. The law is not something, Not the law is not purely coercive. Well, the law is coercive, mm -hmm. but it's something bad, okay, but you you have to do something bad to achieve a good result. And that's is that seen as a Western and alien idea by many Chinese? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, today, for example, in China, the rule of law is still a, a good, um, something they want to promote. We look, look at, read the books, the first page, the rule of law, blah, 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 blah. And then if you look, read, read history, I say, watch. Uh, chain the legalist. Mm -hmm. There are more, many ideas in the legalist literature. Mm -hmm. But then they said, well, the first sentence, rule of law, the legalist uh, idea of law. The second sentence, no, it's different from uh, the Western uh, idea of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. They don't explain why. Uh -huh. That's true. Now, there, there's a difference. The legalist did not have the constitutional law, right? But if you want to have the rule of law, the general idea of law abidance, the law is public, mm -hmm. clear, clear. Mm -hmm. the personal virtues is suitable, mm -hmm. I'm virtuous. Mm -hmm. The one, one weakness of Confucianism is everything is very vague, very broad, they talk pretty, benevolence and righteousness, mm -hmm. okay, what is that? But if you go, the law is detailed, definite. Mm -hmm. So something the Chinese had to do is to go detailed, definite, then you can argue about it, right or wrong, and the consequence, you look at that, the practical side. That is, they have to fill that up. Then law abidance create a general 
respect for the law, then you can have constitutional law. Otherwise, constitutional law is empty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as important as that is, and I share your view that it is very important, uh, over the long stretch of Chinese dynastic history, mm -hmm. uh, the elite didn't do that bad a job in running the country. I mean, the country wasn't usually badly run. So um, I don't know if that was because Confucianism compensated to some degree for the absence of a, <clears throat> of a concept of law because China was fortunate in, in, in other respects. If you look at Rome, where there was, um, there was in the Roman Republic the notion of a constitution. Uh, it was a constitution, as you point out, that was tipped strongly toward the wealthy, but still there was a way of making decisions and a kind of checks and balances type of system that for a long time worked, limited the power of, of, of individuals and even whole groups of, of, of people. Uh, by the time we get to the empire, that is at best window dressing. Uh, there's not very much of the kind of checks and balances really in operation anymore. The emperor is the sole ruler, uh, though there is some facade of, of, of republicanism that continues. But you do have, as, as you point out, even though it's no longer the rule of law in that constitutional sense, you do have a rule by law, which is very different from what is going on in China and is certainly very important for the future. Uh, of the West, and, and, and what is that distinction between the rule of and the rule by law? Well, the distinction between the rule of law and rule by law is rule of law has some constitutional law, that it means some uh, rules governed structure that structured the political power, how are political power distributed, and so on and so forth. And actually, the rule of law, the constitutional law, the idea developed very late, uh, even in Western. Side, uh, the rule, but the rule of law has to depend on a bit everyone uh, respect the law. To respect the law, especially those who have power, they have to respect the law. Okay, but uh, for that uh, respect for the law to develop, you have to depend on the rule by law. That mm. means the laws were already there, mostly penal and civil laws that has not nothing to do with the government. But everybody said, okay, yeah, they are the rules. We play by the rules of the game. The idea of play by the rules of the game is uh, the rule by law. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. so, so everything, if, actually the law is not strictly coercive that you do something. You set up some rules, brought, uh, the delimitation of what you can do and you cannot. Actually open, open this up, what you can do. is actually the law, if you think about personal relation, father and son after mm -hmm. video party. There's a very the emotional bond is very restricting. If you think about just the rule the law said, okay, you, the, the very broad outline, so this you you can do. You don't go outside, mm -hmm. but inside you can mm -hmm. do whatever you like. Mm -hmm. It's actually very liberating. Mm -hmm. And that that's why uh, something I think find the, uh, the recent Chinese uh, in the 19th century, people find that the Western idea is liberating as one of uh, this you liberate you from personal relations of very mm -hmm. emotional binding. Mm -hmm. You just you relax the emotional bond and say, okay, this is a lot of things you can do within this boundary. Mm -hmm. So this is a type of idea that we can uh, that China can very well develop. The notion of a say in civil law of a formal contract mm -hmm. between two people who are doing business right. together that you can take to court uh, if someone breaks it. Um, does that have any equivalent in, in China? Did, or was it always, if businessmen wanted to operate outside their family, mm -hmm. uh, did they just do it on the basis of personal trust and it uh, didn't go beyond that? No, there has to be something, the contract, for example, uh, signing a lease, mm -hmm. okay, there are some primitive uh, legal, uh, civil laws mm -hmm. beyond Land relationships are most important. So if you're uh, selling uh, land, you would actually land, be a Leasing land, yeah. Uh -huh. some, so the, but those have been very, very primitive. Mm -hmm. See, the Romans, very, the, the Roman civil laws developed. They just spell out all the details. Mm -hmm. Chinese, in the Chinese, there always this idea from Confucius. If you want to litigate, litigate is something very bad. Uh -huh. The good government has no litigation. Everyone is happy with each other. So in this kind of mentality, the civil law is something that remains undeveloped. Mm -hmm. So if you so that's why now for in the simple society in Chinese just agra, uh, agra, agrarian society just land mostly mm -hmm. land 
if you think about in the commercial society, they form corporations and all this complex right. things. Mm -hmm. Then it, it, it depends on the civil laws or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And if you think about contract and tort laws, so in the old Confucian idea that litigation is something bad, you don't want to that. That's the civil laws. No, it's not absolutely them. impossible. You can yes, go to but, the magistrates uh -huh. if you want. Mm -hmm. You can. But the good Confucian uh, officers have said, if you come to litigate, you stay in prison for a long time to think about it. <laughs> and then yeah, the people repent how we should not repent the okay. So the, the ideal would be that the, the, the two virtuous people, if they have a disagreement, sit down and just talk it through themselves mm -hmm. rather than go to appeal to some some legal standard for, yeah. to, to settle to settle things. So your 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 view of Rome on the one hand uh, is a kind of positive one in that they were laying the basis, in some ways at least, for something that would be important throughout Western history and part of the the way in which Western history has been kind of productive and creative and how commerce has developed and, and, and things along those lines. But on the other hand, uh, as glorious as the Roman Empire was, um, it was uh, perhaps, in, in fact, as, as cruel in many respects as the uh, Qin Emperor was accused of being, uh, that there was a, a level of brutality uh, in the Roman Empire that exceeded uh, that that you would have found in the Qin or the Han dynasties. And, and could you explain that part of the equation? Oh, yeah. Um, the Romans far more brutal. I think the Romans were a sort of singularity in brutalness, I think. Um, Even compared, compared to the Greeks, for example. In the Greeks, right. yeah, mm -hmm. right. Uh -huh. um, for, first, for, first of all, in, in the wartime, the war behavior, um, the Romans, everyone who had resisted them, they, they killed off. And you, a lot of times when they conquered a city, they kill every, everyone and enslave the others. Now, now the king of, of, of Qin was accused of that, but do but you think that's not really true if you look at the record? Okay, the record is true. Mm -hmm. The king of uh, Qin was accused of one, actually once. Um, uh, they won, he, uh, they won, the Qin fought a big battle and then they killed off all the uh, prisoners of war. That happened, but it's not a, a decision from the top, it was the decision of the field general. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he did. He got all those prisoners, and he said that well, they will rebel. They've been fighting each other for a long time. So and then he decided, well, uh, if we didn't kill them all, they will rebel at all. If we release them, they will come back and fight us again. Mm -hmm. So he killed them. And later on, actually, he personally took responsibility for that and commit suicide. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So it was not a decision for the for the emperor. So they said. And usually, uh, the idea of kill, okay, that's, that's one thing about the chain. They have got this reward system. If you kill an enemy, if a soldier kill an enemy, they got reward. Mm -hmm. So they that encourage brutality. But there's singly that the, each, each, well, each soldier, if you killed an uh, armored soldier, no, enemy, then mm -hmm. you got Not civilians. It's not civilians. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Romans had no make no distinction between the civilians and the military part. They just kill everyone. Mm -hmm. That's that in China was not a. As I I don't think there's anything equivalent mm -hmm. in China. That and that was part of their success. They uh, they t terrorized the, the the people around them, so it was it made it easier for them to expand right, because they right. had this. Uh -huh. Genghis Khan was a little bit like that in in the earlier part of his career. The Mongols, right? Where they they right. did a lot of exemplary killing for the mm -hmm. sake of you don't surrender to us we kill you if you right. surrender then things will be fine and just pay a tax and mm -hmm. it'll be it'll be okay right so and uh, Tamerlane and folks like that so so they weren't absolutely unique but they certainly compared to the Chinese and they and they maintained a much larger military force throughout the history of, of, of the Empire did they did they not uh, and then the I Chinese mean, did oh the, the Romans yes oh yes yes uh-huh uh, well in the Republican time, the, the army was mostly drafted at the beginning, draftees. But in the empire, they have a, this imperial army, 100,000 strong, actually 300,000 strong, um, including auxiliaries. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, uh, in the empire, at the, at the beginning, at two, two centuries, uh, for the first two centuries of the empire, the Rome had no foreign threat. The barbarians were just, mm -hmm. they can take mm -hmm. care of them in no time. 
but they kept such a large army there, standing army, for the emperor's sake, the emperor's the mm -hmm. great power by mm -hmm. the So this kind of a large standing army, there's no equivalent in China. So uh, once the Han Dynasty was established and had secured itself uh, after the fall of the Qin, mm -hmm. uh, the, they, they maintained a relatively modest military force mm -hmm. and lo relied on peasants mainly in, in the need of an economic crisis. They sort of recruited peasants. Yeah, they, they, they actually, they was, that was the Qin system. Mm -hmm. Qin was also, they have got this, uh, uh, they distributed it into the, uh, the peasants and it one tax and then uh, service in the army about two years per, life, per person per lifetime. Mm -hmm. per lifetime. Um, but Han uh, inherited that, that system. But it actually, for the Han at the beginning of the Han Dynasty, there was all the nomads, the Xiongdu from the north. What they do is they were willing to pay tribute mm -hmm. to the Xiongdu for 60 years, so uh, instead of fighting it. Which the Romans prized. Wow, would not have, would not have I must be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> would not have, not have permitted them to do. Uh, and, and the Roman Empire, you make a very interesting calculation. The Roman Empire was much more expensive. It, it, it uh, consumed more of the wealth of Rome, one would, of the Roman Empire, one would think, mm -hmm. than the Chinese Empire did. Uh, what what did you find there? I know that you you did these very interesting calculations mm -hmm. about the uh, apart from the army, just the the expense of the civil administration. Yeah, one of the um, when I read the literature, mm -hmm. one thing I found very interesting is that um, people sometimes say that the Roman um, government is very light, the Chinese bureaucracy is very large and clumsy. So I did some comparison that just. Um, Find out, I found out the first well, this saying is based on Chinese uh, the record on the bureaucracy is very very detailed. Mm -hmm. They record down to the very the, the eight the clubs and so on. All everyone on the government uh, payroll they recorded. Okay, so therefore they said okay, there's about hundred thousand bureaucrats mm -hmm. that include everything everyone down to the the, the, the clubs. But on the Roman side. See, the Roman, the, uh, the uh, local municipalities were self-governed. So the Romans only counted high officials, mm -hmm. uh, the provincial governors mm -hmm. and so on. So there were only a few hundreds. Mm -hmm. So they compared, of course, right. the Roman mm -hmm. life. So I went in and compared, the, uh, uh, okay, the same, the, the organization, the imperial organization quite similar. Each uh, empire had about 100 provinces, provincial governors appointed by the uh, top. So I compare all the top officials and, down and count them one by one. Mm -hmm. Okay, you count, count up without 230 mm -hmm. plus or minus 10 mm -hmm. uh, officials from the top to the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, to the from the top to the uh, provincial governor mm -hmm. and his adjunct, mm -hmm. so military. Mm -hmm. or something. Okay, so both sides the the top bureaucracy is about the same. But of course, the Roman governors came to the province with uh, an entourage. Of course. That didn't count, usually that didn't count, the Chinese counted. So if I count everything down to the provincial level, they were comparable. Mm -hmm. What is different, uh, what was different was that the Chinese, the locality was also a government payroll, central government on the government payroll. But on the Roman side, the municipalities were local government. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was the big difference. Mm -hmm. But still, local government is not no government. The, the locality, mm -hmm. the local mm -hmm. aristocrats still have to pay mm -hmm. tax on to the emperor mm -hmm. and uh, depend on him to boost up their. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the, the local level. That's the most the, 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 the biggest difference between China and Rome, and because of the central government in Chinese, because the central government penetrate a deeper into the locality level. I think that's one reason why the Chinese Empire can just resume itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the people at the top um, in, in Rome, uh, you calculated what their pay was based on the pay, say, of an ordinary soldier. Mm -hmm. And then you did the same for the people at the top in China. 
and you get a very big ratio. You know, oh yeah, Romans were were living much better than Roman. Uh, yeah, Roman. well, if I want to, be, if I'm a buffisho, I want to be a Roman. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all. all that's in it. But at the same time, the Romans allowed for local autonomy and a certain amount of limited self-government, mm -hmm. whereas in China it was bureaucracy all the way down, almost maybe mm -hmm. until the village level. You had a little bit of. Uh, uh, kind of peasants sitting down together and having a headman and making decisions, but you you don't have in a in a Chinese city at any time during the history of imperial China you don't have an elected city council and a mayor and a sense of corporate identity they govern themselves which you you'd have to some degree in the in the Roman Empire as you had in Greece mm -hmm. and that's another difference in terms of the long term continuation of, of of East and West yes but the Roman Empire was fiscally. It really, uh, you know, very expensive and presumably more oppressive um, than than the, the Chinese Empire was. Yes, uh, the tax uh, tax burden is heavy, much mm -hmm, was, much mm -hmm, heavier. Mm -hmm. Why did why did these two emperor, emperor empires finally fall? I mean, they lasted a long time. Mm -hmm. They lasted Roman Empire from Augustus to the fall of the West is almost half a millennium. Uh, and the Han Dynasty, with an interruption and the kind of then recreated, uh, is about 400 years, I think, from from beginning to, mm -hmm. to end. Uh, so that's a very, uh, in historical terms, that's great success. That's that's a long endurance. Nothing lasts forever. But why did they finally uh, collapse? Were there different reasons, or were there similar reasons? Well, eventually, the big collapse is for half of the empire before or to the foreigners. In the, the in the West, side, yeah. mm -hmm. in the West oh, and the in the East too, actually, in right in the too, north, yeah, the north part of China, yeah, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, half of uh, the North China, the, mm -hmm. the developed half, fell to the nomads. Okay, and in China, the Rome was the fall of the Western Roman mm -hmm. Empire was final. Mm -hmm. In China, the fall of Northern China <coughs> uh, continued for four or five, four more than four centuries before China was unified again. So for that half a cent, uh, for that about four centuries, China was essentially total, uh, divided into two, or so, divided into many, many parts. Right, the, sudden, the, the South was divided into different states, Chinese states, and the North no. had a succession of, of sort of Turkish dynasties. And so, well, actually, actually, the North start with, um, the, uh, it's called five, uh, five Wu people and mm -hmm. 16 kingdoms. Mm -hmm. they, uh, the five ethnic minorities just keep on fighting each other, uh -huh. take over and form mm -hmm. kingdoms. Mm -hmm. There's to to totally chaos in the, in the world. And the South is a succession of uh, dynasties. But so the final four was for half of the, the mm -hmm. more important part of the uh, empire fell to foreigners mm -hmm. at the time. But I think before the fall, for, before the fall to barbarians, so, uh, the internal com the internal structure, the internal constitution of empires had decayed to such an extent mm -hmm. that they just could not. The, actually, if you think about the calculate the, the number of barbarians coming mm -hmm. and the uh, advantage of the barbarians, the barbarians well, they were now few in number, they were not organized, and they had they were more fierce fight in fighting. But in, in everything else, they were inferior. Mm -hmm. How can how could mm -hmm. they well, take over? That's I think because the internal organization of the empire had decayed. They have no organization power, no ability to mobilize the resources of the empire to to mm, to resist the foreign threats. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the Roman and, and the Chinese are the same thing. And in, in is it? A question of corruption in both cases, people losing their sense of public service. What 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 is happening that is actually weakening the fabric of empire in both the West and the East? Corruption, and uh, okay, if you want to cohere an empire, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Um, people have local uh, local uh, loyalty first. Uh, later, uh, as the empire age, the coherence. Of the loyalty to the top just decayed. Mm -hmm. People no longer uh, look up to the empire, emperor for to solve their problem. They look to the local leaders to solve this problem. So eventually, what happened is the local people that they have warlords forming. Mm -hmm. The Chinese warlords are more civilian, grassroots type of warlords. Mm -hmm. The Roman warlords were 
because the Romans had a large standing army, mm-hmm. the Roman, Roman warlords were from the army, the army legions. Um, okay, this army group, the uh, uh, armies in Britain, mm-hmm. have their own, mm-hmm. uh, em- uh, declare their own mm-hmm. emperor and so on. Mm-hmm. So Roman, because of the La army, had the local, the army local, local army groups. Chinese, because they didn't have a large army, they have civilian local groups. So the local groups form up and they arm themselves, become local warlords, and the warlords took over. Bef- before the barbarians came, the warlords took over. Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Romans also have civil wars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, what had held the empire, to, um, both empires together, was a kind of sense of, uh, of, of political community that gradually disintegrates uh, as people become more self-serving and as institutions kind of divide up factionally along the lines of, of, of different leaders in different places. Mm-hmm. That's sort of a common pattern that, that you're seeing in yes. this. Uh, and then the barbarians sort of take advantage. They're always out there, but now they can... Of course, in the West, it was partly uh, something triggered by um, things happening in, in, in on the steppe, where, where barbarian peoples were moving around in a way that they hadn't before. And I don't know if that's true in China as well, is it? Oh, the uh, barbarians in the steppe. Actually, the barbarians always in the in the doors. The step, uh, the Mongolian step, is mm-hmm. right on the doors. Right, right. Of China. much closer. So yeah, much mm-hmm. closer. They have been at the beginning of the Han. The or the, the, they were already threat in there. So that's that's why the Han paid tribute to them for mm-hmm. sixty years, and finally the Han took up the decide. Okay, we have to fight them. So they fought them for a century. Eventually, they drove the the the, the, the snow by the way, and uh, the. Uh, the story, one story is that they drove the, uh, the nomads away, the nomads broke west, mm-hmm. and those nomads later on became the Huns, mm-hmm. the press on the Roman mm-hmm. Empire. That has been a story, but this story has very few evidence. Oh, I say it's conjectured. And conjectured. But if, essentially, if you think about the step of the nomads move around, it's huge. this size huge, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the, <laughs> this is like Philip Ford. The, mm-hmm. the, the, this, uh, this group of nomads pinch on that and mm-hmm. that uh, nomad uh, move around. So mm-hmm. there may be some uh, cause, in, cause, of cause and effect mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. But between the, if you think of the time frame, uh, when the Han drove the nomad away, it took two centuries before the Huns uh, appeared. Okay, so that cause and effect is very, mm-hmm. very. very <laughs> what are the what are the lessons? And you've talked a little bit about the sort of lessons uh, that that China might learn from its past and the need for law. Uh, are there any other lessons uh, that both people in the East and people in the West can derive from the history of these two empires and their and their final um, decline? Uh, uh, what 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 in the West could we learn from from Chinese history that that might uh, uh, be valuable to us? The story of the Qin and Han dynasties. Uh, well, as I said, uh, the Chi. The Chinese have two lines of thought: the Confucian, which is more um, family-oriented, emotional or emotional tied, and the legalist, which is rule-oriented. Um, if you think about the political thinking, the legalist had pol- uh, often pol- introduced political thought in China, mm-hmm. but that has been discredited. So the Chinese actually, traditionally, for about two thousand years. They lack a political, what Westerners call political thinking. Mm-hmm. That's how do we structure the political power, distribution of political power. That depends a lot of negotiation, mm-hmm. thinking, mm-hmm. and then arguments. Also, mm-hmm. they never developed that. So this is the weakness of the Chinese. They can learn from the West. Mm-hmm. Actually, if they are good, they should go back to their own roots for some of the rigorous thinking, mm-hmm. rehabilitate them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But on the West side, the Chinese. They have uh, this government, if you look at the government, she said, Mm -hmm. compare the Chinese government, it's more lighter on the people, Mm -hmm. tax burden are lighter, Mm -hmm. and there are more welfare um, welfare provision for Mm -hmm. the uh, Mm -hmm. people, even in Han Dynasty. Mm -hmm. The old people and the widowed and the orphans, they, they were t- t- taken care of. But they do it less expensively. Less expensively, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because the, the government officials were paid 
the, the compensation is one 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 percent yeah. of the mm-hmm. Roman officials. Mm-hmm. So in this way, there's a sort of um, the officials they got idea of a stewardship. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. supposed to be the take care of the, mm-hmm. of the people, and a lot of this is from personal character. I'm not an official. I should develop this outlook to take care of the people, mm-hmm. and this is more. Um, humane way of this a more more wrong and more humane way of government. So it's a softer way of oh, approaching. Though it, it, it threatens if it gets too far to make exactly. people passive. Right. You don't want them to be too dependent. Mm-hmm. And also if it gets too far, it get all all sorts of personal connections, mm-hmm. corruptions come in. Uh-huh. See, okay. mm-hmm. if you want to, corruption is something that the rule has to prevent to collect uh, corruption. Now I gather nowadays your your project is to try to Create a sort of a synthesis in in out of out of Chinese thought between the Confucian and the legal legalist tradition, to kind of find a way in which Confucianism and uh, rule of law can sort of stand together as twin prompts. Uh, for is that is that a fair characterization of what you're now trying to do? Yes, that I am. Uh-huh. Yeah. And and when will we see the result? <laughs> oh, that will be some time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and you say you can do this in Chinese rather than in English. All right. I I think this is uh, this topic is more interesting in Chinese. Mm-hmm. The, in, in the Western world, you have your own problems, right? <laughs> right. But you, so so in this case, you're going to be speaking to a Chinese audience. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, very good luck with that, and and thank you for so much for coming. Um, uh, it's really been uh, very interesting to kind of hear you out and the bold thinking that you've done on on this broad comparative theme. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it.